So folks remember during Trump's regime, uh, he launched a bunch of tariffs, right, at, at, at China, kind of escalating a little. Uh, I would argue their war positionality that they're fighting with each other, these two inter-imperialist, these imperialist forces. And without getting into an ideological debate, so you understand my position, I do think China is an imperialist power, so I'm just state that so to get it over with. You can agree or disagree. Um, but what I want to illustrate here, this is China's response. And this is from the New York Times. There's some better articles. But this is from the New York Times. So on your left, it says this is the map where China's retaliatory tariffs threaten American jobs the most. And then it says on the right, looks similar to the one showing where voters backed President Trump. So I want you to ask yourself, how did China get this level of knowledge? Right? And then ask yourself, why the fuck don't we have this level of knowledge? We live here. Right? And they produced this in three days. They released this three days after he, he set his tariffs off. So this is pre-existing knowledge of how the, the thing works, how this joint works. Right? They didn't have to wait. Right? They probably had to make some command and control decisions. Do we want to pull this trigger? Do we not want to do it? But they already knew this. Why don't we know this? And this level of detail, right? Because they, they, you can kind of strike widely if you want to, but the level of detail of, all right, you, you hurt me. I'm not only going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt this particular administration and its social base. Like targeted from a perspective of like, I'm not trying to really go to total war with the United States, but I am trying to hurt you. Right? And to move you out of the way so I can deal with the, with the rest of this, your empire in a particular way uh, uh, and the way that they've been mutually developing over the past 50 years in particular. Right? So, I want to show this first because you heard me say, um, and I do fundamentally believe this, and, I, and I'll explain why that I do think we, we, the left, and that's, to me, let me be clear about, so, so I don't like leave things undefined. Uh, when I say the left, I'm talking about <coughs> anarchists, communists, socialists, revolutionary nationalists, and indigenous forces who view themselves in some relationship to popular movements. Not all do, some, do, uh, some don't. But that is what I am defined. That may not be your definition of the left, and that's fine. That's the definition that I'm working with. So you understand and, and understand some of the assumptions that, that, that are embedded in this analysis. And all analysis are based in, in assumptions. And it's better to kind of reveal those assumptions as my uh, uh, perspective so we know what we're working with. So having said that, it's my firm belief that we are doing enough to shake fundamental elements of this empire, if we so choose, the weakest part of our practice, we don't know each other, uh, we're too damn sectarian, yeah. right? Um, some other things I can say there, but <laughs> too damn sectarian. Um, and we're involved more in protesting than we are in building, right? More in protesting than we are in building. So what this proposes is a shift in highlighting more of what we build. And then the hard work of this is, if, if you say that there is enough, how do you connect it? Right? And how do you connect it in a democratic way? That's the key operative piece. Because embedded within this joint of what I'm presenting 
um, is a notion of, of planning, but not central planning. Right? Planning, but not central planning. And why planning? This gets into some of the heart of the, the goals and objectives that I think we need to pursue. And I, I tried to break them down. I'm going to take this off. Um, into some like some aims and objectives stated in the negative. And what we're like with, within the formulation of cooperation Jackson has been asking for is like this take all those combined forces, not asking you to commit to an ideological program, right? But a practical program of practice, right? Like you can do mutual aid whether you're a communist or revolutionary nationalist, doesn't really matter, right? per se, what your political or ideological orientation is. You might move it and you might want to serve different people for different reasons. That, that's all fair and game. But it doesn't require you to kind of shift your whole worldview to engage in these, these set of practices. And that's what this whole piece is really saying. Our strength has to now be building networks and a new type of networks, a new type of organization. Right? So part of this calls for a new model. One that's undefined in many senses, and one that I believe that we're going to have to learn through practice how to do. Right? I do think that there's some elements of more experience than theory that will get us there. Right? And let me say that again. I do think that there are elements of experience more than theory that will get us there. What do I mean by that? I'm one who doesn't believe that we need to shy away from any of the experiences of the of the 19th or the 20th century, using the Roman calendar, right? Recognize them for their strengths and recognize them for their failures. And be thankful that we have anything to even model, even in the negative, right? That we can learn from and say, I, I don't want to make that mistake, or I don't want to repeat that mistake, right? But it requires us to study them and study them in detail and try to study them as honestly and as critically as possible. Um, and so what some of these are, people, I know some people can't, I assume that people can read that, again, that was an assumption or it would be big enough. So stated in the negative, ending the regimes of, of private ownership of the means of production, production, ending the regime of commodity uh, production, ending the regime of wage labor, ending the regimes of labor segmentation, because there's different aspects. Uh, when I say regime, that not all these different forms of exploitation are uniform every place. There's common dynamics. But how labor segmentation, say, looks in a, a sweatshop is different than how it might look in a Manhattan, you know, uh, high rise uh, uh, where there's a nanny and doing all this other kind of shit, right? Uh, it's, it's totally different kind of things. But they're related in their outcomes. Um, ending the regimes of hydrocarbon extraction and dependency and ending the regimes of settler colonialism, land commodification, Imperial extraction and unequal and undemocratic exchange. So that's stated in the negative. Stated in the, in the, in the positive, it's not exactly all the same thing, but heading in that, in that dem uh, uh, direction, socializing production and reproduction, democratizing society, socializing all land and housing, and localizing governance and direct democracy. Right? Simple things said in, pra in theory, the practice is hard, and primarily because we've all been socialized in capitalism, which means we, we're, we got a lot of competition in us, right? We got a lot of, of, of weird ass ways we view value and what we value and who we value. Uh, and these are all things that are not gonna be undone tomorrow or next week that are gonna have to constantly be struggled for. Um, so trying to break this down, the, the, the piece of what the building fight for is asking for is, look, um, these are a set of practices that we are asking folks to adopt. If you're already doing them, the thing is to, to try to expand your network to folks who are maybe doing some of these other activities that you are not doing not always trying to replicate or, or build and expand on new things. That's not always necessary or possible. But then there's the challenge that we have, um, I think particularly in the early stage, of 
competing with the existing system, right, for adoption. Competing with the existing system for adoption. What do I mean by that? We're not trying to compete to outproduce them in making computers. Like this was one of the problems the Soviet Union kind of got trapped into, right? We got to make just as many cars as the Americans make. We got to make just as many bombs as the Americans make, just as many tanks as the Americans make. Uh, uh, so it took, shifted their production totally from their own, uh, the, the own use of the folks within their community into this very defensive posture, which limited their productive capacities in a lot of ways. There's reasons for that. I'm not you know, ne negating it. We can talk about that and debate about that. But this one is saying we need to encourage more folks to, to take up production for need not production for commodity exchange or com com production for profit. And so within that, that's why, you know, th there's no kind of prescribed per se hierarchy within what's suggested. Like these things happen and will happen and are happening in a mutual way already. Like, but we do want to suggest kind of a, a slight order of prioritization for a particular reason. Now, if, if we're doing this to try to develop planning from below, we know from history there's a particular problem of a lot of planning projects like so-called complex societies. And that is ascertaining people's needs, right? If you look up a lot of the standard kind of uh, uh, literature, particularly Marxist literature, they call this the, the, uh, uh, the computation problem. Right? And, and to give folks who aren't familiar with how some of those production systems worked, right, the, the party and the party apparatus would say, we need to, you know, your unit needs to produce this much wheat this year. Your unit needs to produce this many, you know, items of clothing or this much X, Y, and Z. And then we're going to allocate resources and capital from the state to you to produce at that particular level. And it often was not necessarily determined by how many people need this much wheat, how many people need X, Y, and Z, right? So it was command from the top, not driven from below of saying, well, actually, this year I'm good with pants. I don't, I don't need any more pants. Right? I need something else. How can I be in touch with the folks who produce that, you know, to ascertain my need to say, I want this or I want that. And in exchange, we'll, we'll barter, we'll trade, we'll do X, Y, and Z to make sure that everybody's needs are met. So it's a different type of planning, but the issue is, how do you calculate that? How do you determine that, right? To try to determine that, we know, I would argue, in the bureaucratic way, really doesn't work, right? It really doesn't work. I'm arguing, and what this argument is, why mutual aid is first, is to look at mutual aid, not just as like, I'm gonna take care of your needs, you take care of mine in a reciprocal way. We have to develop it, I'm arguing, this needs to be our calculation problem solving mechanism. Right? Our mutual aid work has to be based upon not just the folks who necessarily we want to extend it, who walk into the door. Right? So it's not a closed system. And we have to recognize, I would argue, not by intent, but a lot of just how society functions and the biases. A lot of our mutual aid work is not for everybody in our communities, it's for our own folk. Right, it's for our own folk. And if we want to shift and win people over, remember, we're, we're trying to win people to adopt this program. I'm not trying to get you to adopt my ideology. I'm trying to get you to adopt a relationship with me of practice. With the theory and the assumption being that it's easier to act our way into new ways of thinking than it is to think our ways into new ways of acting. Right? That's the... So I'm not going to get into... I don't want to get into a whole bunch of ideological debates with the folks, like in Jackson. I'm not going to get... I try not to get into a whole bunch of ideological debates with just folks on the, on the community level. Right? There are other folks I do all the time, but there's... there's 
uh, but folks just on the basic community level, I really don't care what the hell you believe. If you have a need, let's figure out how to fill it. And to the extent that it's not, you're not aiming to destroy me or destroy somebody else, I can work with you. Right? And so what that means is, you know, uh, and, and, and Imani would tell you, uh, we're working with this one sister right now who is a hardcore fundamentalist Christian. Right? But she has a housing need. And she don't share, like, our views, you know, around gender and sexuality. And so many people, like, if you heard, you'd be like, well, y'all working with her? Like, yes, we are working with her. Right? Because that's a portal and a doorway to building relations of not working within the ideological framework, but to fill a particular need <clears throat> that then builds a level of trust in the broader community about, you know, who we are, how we relate, and you don't have to believe in what we believe in to get down with what we do. Right? Yeah. So that's why, in part, this one is, is kind of first. Right? Because we have to figure out how do we actually engage folks where their needs really are in a broad democratic way and move this beyond it just being a relationship with the folks that we know. If we're serious about those other aims and objectives. Right? Because these practices have to move outside of our own folks. That's a critical piece. Um, then the second piece, <coughs> talking about order of operations, is also trying to identify a, 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 and correct a particular historical kind of shortcoming, at least in many kind of like Western societies. The food sovereignty the piece. One of the weakest things that we have about a lot of our mutual aid work is that it's, a, it's dependent upon extracting from already existing market relations, right? So without getting anybody in trouble or myself in trouble. Uh, we often have to beg, build, borrow, or something else to get what we need, right, to, to supply our people's needs. Because we are not in direct relationship with producers of food, producers of goods, various goods, material goods, to ascertain what we need. And the first level of what I think we need to like switch, switch, switch is on this food sovereignty question. Why? I'm going to draw from example because I think examples make everything concrete. We saw, I think, something very brilliant, very spontaneous and beautiful in March through basically June of 2020 on this very question. Farmers... Many farmers, particularly in the Midwest and the South, the areas I know best, uh, cut out the damn middleman to meet direct people's needs and set up with like food pantries or just folks in their community. They went straight, not to the grocery store, but just straight up distribution centers to, to meet people's needs directly. And what I think that demonstrated is We know how to do that if we so choose. And the challenge is how do we move that direct relationship out of times of crisis and into the normal way in which we do business? Like, is that possible? We saw for a brief period of time, yes, there's some possibility of doing this. Now, we have to be mindful in all this that... <clears throat> well, let me, I'll get to that later. So... The, the third one, um, if you look on some of the pieces we put out originally, it said cooperative kind of like economics. And the more we were kind of working on this, like that's actually a misnomer, right? And it limits who we're talking about. And one of the main premises of this is that we're starting from where people actually are, right? There are millions of people in the United States doing million, uh, uh, mutual aid work right now. Millions, not like tens of thousands. There's millions of people already doing that. There's millions of people involved in some level of food production right now. From growing, your, people growing their own gardens to all the community garden stuff that's going on, uh, to more people going back to the land doing farming. Like there's already millions of people who are doing this. So we, and part of this reasoning is we often worry about, well, we got to recruit, we got to recruit, we got to bring more people over to our kind of perspective and our kind of view without looking at what, there's already millions of people doing these things. 
So how do we network with the folks who are already doing and did, you know, uh, coalesce around a program which says, your, you know, your production can serve a broader need and be tied into a network which helps extend what you are doing, secure what you are doing. So starting with what we have and not looking at what our present situation is one of a deficit. Like a lot of our organizing model, our argument, is always premised around deficits, right? Like we don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. Like individually we might not have it, organizationally we might not have it, but that's not true if we look at the broad sense of who is out there and where they are. So it becomes more of a question of how do we connect. Um, so we switched this one from like cooperative production to uh, worker self-management, self-organization. And why, why? If you just state it as kind of cooperative production, even though that might be an aim and objective, at least one that we're pushing, you kind of exclude 99% of the people, working people in this country who don't do cooperative work, or at least are not doing that immediately, right? And if you just focus in on like union organizing, union organizing really only touches about 10% of working people in this country at this point, and that's shrinking. Right? It's shrinking. Despite all the stuff you hear about Amazon and Starbucks, it's still shrinking. They're destroying public workers, sector workers, teachers, unions. That stuff is getting destroyed at the same time as other sectors seem to be growing. And then even some of these new things are tenuous. Like the Starbucks workers unionized, they closed the Starbucks. The Amazon workers am, uh, uh, organized, they still don't have a contract. Uh, to my knowledge, if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, and Amazon can just say, what the hell was Staten Island? We're going to move someplace else. Right? They got that kind of capital and resources, and they have a, a strategy. Like, one, we're, they're about to open up a fulfillment, fulfillment center in, in uh, Canton, 20 miles from where we are in Mississippi. And it's very clear if you look at what they're doing, they're in the process of conquering the 20 corridor, right, as a new base of operations. And, and distribution within the South that's taken away from all the other places that might potentially unionize. Very explicit strategy. That's why they got the, the piece in uh, uh, um, Tuscaloosa, and that's why they're moving to Jackson, and that's why they're staying away from Atlanta. Right? So one is in Tuscaloosa, is in Alabama, uh, and Canton is in Mississippi, all along the 20 free, freeway. And that gives you all this access. I can lay out a, a map of how the empire is laid out. Gives you tremendous access to any point, point in time. And both of those have sizable airports. They're connected to seaports, to sea lanes, very con uh, connectedly. And there's an old, the old infrastructure of the railroad is already built in there. So they, they're relying upon knowledge and infrastructure similar to what we saw the Chinese do. Amazon has that same level of knowledge of how the economy functions and works, which we need to get. But the critical piece to, to move on around the worker piece, I want to put out a challenge, and, and people could, could accept it. Uh, I think I'm not opposed to union organizing. I think how union organizing has now been dominated and framed is worthless. And that going along with the pieces that if we're going to encourage folks, I think, from this point forward to do collective organizing, first, you know, organize for solidarity amongst your co-workers. But what are the aims and objectives? If the aim and objective is just to have better working conditions and better wages and health care, you're shooting yourself in the foot, I would argue. Right? Because fundamentally, the economy right now in the U.S., that's what we're talking about, is not going to sustain those on the individual level, on the corporate level. Not that they can't afford it, some of them, right? But it just cuts into how they actually make profits. And this is one of the critical things about the age. Most of these big behemoths, they don't actually make their profits from sales. Are we clear about that? <laughs> Amazon does not make its money from moving books or moving things, you know, uh, through its warehouses. Amazon makes the vast majority of its money and corporate buyback stock options, money manipulation. That's where it makes most of its money. Apple does the same thing. 
Uber, Lyft, most of them have never actually made a profit in the traditional sense. Right, like the, I think Uber, if you look at it, the, the model fundamentally is failing. Right? But their stock options look fucking great. Right, so it keeps them afloat. So just thinking that we're gonna target them in that particular way, the old ways of like, you know, strikes in some particular, like that's not really gonna cut it most, most anymore. So we have to, to try to take over the whole thing. So if we're gonna do this type of organizing, I would encourage us, we need to be trying to, 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 in every place, in every factory, we're gonna turn that factory into a co-op. That's where the broader question of, of self-management, self-organization comes in. Um, uh, the last one is like community production <clears throat> uh, that I'll talk about um, in this, to this level of detail. So community production, we use that, and most people think when we use it in Jackson, we're just talking about like 3D printing, right? Uh, and that's a particular piece of what we're doing in digital fabrication, but it's a minor piece in the long run. The thing about this one is how do you localize the, the, the production of the, the kind of necessary material, uh, the industrial products we may want to keep in the future and that we might need? Right, with an understanding, at least it's, it's my view, this is not necessarily Cooperation Jackson's view, it's my view as an eco-socialist that we are not trying to change society and just keep this, what exists, right, but just have more of it to distribute more to more people. Right, a lot of us, I think, when we think of like socialism, is like we're gonna have all the capital goods without the exploitation. Well, what the hell would that do to the earth? Right, it would de de deplete it pretty quickly. That is not that that is not sustainable. That is not where we need to go, right? Unless y'all are planning to go on the Mars and doing the Star Trek thing, <laughs> right? And uh, I believe we are made for this planet. All the other stuff is great and imaginary, uh, but I'm not with the settler program. So that's that's just me. Um, so understanding that our our understanding of what this peace would be, what the social and the socialism would be, is not just more distribution of other goods, but changing how they're produced, why they're produced, what function they serve, and how can this all eliminate the forms of extraction and exploitation, marginalization that exists. But then meeting it so that all our needs are fundamentally met. And we've already gotten to a place that we know that at least on a material level, I would argue for most of the last hundred years, Everybody's caloric needs, housing needs, medical needs could be met by the existing levels of production. Like that question has long been solved. Uh, it may sound like I'm beating up on the Soviets, that's not my intent, but to learn from their experience, right? Um, and part of their experience was they went for heavy and hard industrialization, right, as quickly as possible. And it left, if you go to large parts of Russia or to Ukraine or to some of the central kind of Asian republics, you see massive wastelands that, that during that period in Africa that they basically just wiped out trying to do that hard and as fast as they possibly could with no plan around regeneration. Like, let's just be honest. There was no plan about how do we restore this environment once we use it? How do we fix this? How do we replenish it? How do we bring the livelihood back? No plan for that. That was a mistake, that was an error, one that we cannot repeat. Now the last <clears throat> two pieces, again, we're competing, and anything we build, let's be real, we're gonna have to learn how to defend it. So that's why the self-defense is up there. I'm not gonna speak that much more, but just keep that principle in mind. Anything we build, we're gonna have to learn how to defend it. And this is a critical one, particularly coming from the, the, the black liberation side of this movement, uh, I want y'all to know, despite what the history books may tell you, black people have built a lot of independent shit in this empire. But you don't know it because most of the shit was destroyed. Right? Entire, just all black towns wiped off the face of the earth. Right? Entire industries, co-ops, wiped off the face of the earth. Um, 
Because we didn't have necessarily, not that we didn't try to defend it, don't get me wrong, we did, valiant fights, but we lost, right? Uh, in part because there was no broader solidarity with you know, the vast majority of folks in this country who didn't look at us as human beings in one form or another. And then the other piece is in order to do all this in a way that is about enhancing production for need, meeting our basic community needs, and doing it in a democratic way, it can't just be mediation between company A and company B. That's still going to leave out a lot of people, right? So like some of the things, if you look at like who is it, Swaggart and some of these other folks, Paracon, some of those systems, a lot of good things to learn from that, right? That some of it I think is implied even in, in here. But some of the things about it that I know I have the criticism of without a broader community function, similar to what Dan was talking about, like the, the community village meeting here and having a broad piece, you're still going to leave out a lot of people if it's just a mutual aid talking to the workers, talking to the folks who are doing the farming. There's still a lot of people who get left out of that, right? Children, elderly people, people with disabilities, they get left out of that unless there's a broader mechanism of, of the democracy that mediates how all these different things could be uh, distributed, produced and produced for, right? Uh, and then this is the piece we ought to, like, some of this is about dealing with how do we move from within a Marxist framework, how do we move from commodity production to use production? It is very much rooted in that, but we're trying to exceed that. Somebody spoke to that, yes, I think it was Quincy, spoke to the limitations of some of that, right? Because if we just try to shift everything to like, what well, we're just gonna produce for need, then the arts and the culture, a lot of that stuff winds up being kind of uh, uh, left out in a very mundane world. Uh, and so we, we have to still recognize that this will still produce enough surplus for all the arts and all the creativity of actually should flourish even more if we get it, get it to the point where we're working smarter, not harder, and we're working less, not more, right, through care kind of relationships that are embedded in this, where folks are, are needed. But it can't just be just production totally for use value. That won't get us where we, we need to go. We have to recognize the other dimensions of things that, that we just do because we like to do it, not because it's going to create more wealth or whatever the situation. We just do it because it gives us pleasure, it gives us joy. And that has to be an accommodation for that. So the... There's, if you look at that, that piece that we formulated, you know, there were some other things associated with it. And these are distributed, this, the distinguished between practices of position and practices of maneuver. So all of what I'm really going to, and I'm not going to speak about the other ones too much because I'm, I'm talking too damn much, uh, practices of position are the things that we can do in the here and now, and we are doing in the here and now that need to be connected. The things that are described here is the practice of maneuver. These are when we aggregate by having a network where we have enough power to actually challenge, to change the system. That's why these things are up there. Like in a prescribed kind of manner, right? So general strike being a particular place of where we have kind of accumulated enough to stop the system, right? Then the other pieces are what are we trying to not negotiate, but because uh, a general strike, fundamentally, the way it's been articulated is still a negotiation, right? Still a negotiation. And I would argue you're, <clears throat> you're negotiating with capital and the state even here. Yeah. You're still negotiating with the existing capital and the state even there. But what's the objective? To get rid of them shits. That's my argument. So, I will stop there. I tried to just make it practical. The last thing is about when you look at this and you're asking us, it's, it's what we're asking folks to do is to consider these as points of uh, adoption that you want to encourage other folks within the broad networks that we are all involved in to pick up as a practical program that we can all do together. Not that we need to do Every single one of us is gonna be doing every single one of those things that's not possible. We don't have the, the, the time as individuals to do that, but we can all be in relationship to do this and then create through the networking broader sets of defined goals, aims, and objectives that get us towards a broader transform transformative piece.
That's the proposal. In short, a lot more detail, a lot of more things that, that we can cover, but I'll end there just for questions, questions and answers.